also drew upon an earlier era of resistance. Shivaji particularly was a very important character in their sort of mental uh, uh, map. And, um, and of course, as I mentioned, Shaktism. And this happens, of course, you can hear when you hear uh, the Vande uh, Mataram, uh, 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 you know, many Muslims refuse to sing it, saying that it is a, uh, uh, a, 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 a it's dedicated to Durga, uh, it is. Uh, because it is very much derives from Shakti iconography. Uh, in fact, Durga herself and, and all the, all the, 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 uh, the Tripura Sundari, i.e. Durga, Lakshmi and Saraswati are explicitly mentioned as a part of that song. Uh, <coughs> and then, of course, there were the initiation rites of the revolutionaries. Um, most of the revolutionaries, when they were initiated into the movement, they would go through this rite in which they were swear to fight for the liberation of, mm, uh, of uh, uh, Bhavani Bharati. Uh, uh, and they would do it in front of an image of a form of Shakti, whether it's Bhavani or Durga or Kali, holding a Gita or other holy book in one hand and a sword or revolver in the other hand. So this is a very important thing to remember because we are in a city where in some ways uh, the intellectual uh, font and father of that, uh, uh, of, of this resistance, uh, came to reside, and uh, uh, Sri Aurobindo. Uh, of course, he was then called Aurobindo Ghosh. Um, unfortunately, uh, the role of Sri Aurobindo or Aurobindo Ghosh uh, as the father of, uh, of our freedom struggle, and specifically of the, of the uh, revolutionary armed strain of, uh, of our freedom struggle, has been largely forgotten. Very often, ignored even by his supposed followers, but in fact he was the father of, uh, he was one of the fathers of our freedom movement, and he was specifically uh, the intellectual font from which the uh, revolutionary uh, movement drew its inspiration. Now, sadly, after independence, the story of India's freedom struggle from the armed uh, uh, lineage uh, was deliberately suppressed. Um, it happens not surprisingly because uh, another group, another lineage of the freedom struggle, the Nehruvian lineage, I won't call him the Gandhian lineage because they, Gandhi died very early in the, in the, in the uh, story. Uh, but the Nehruvian lineage came to power and they systematically tried to increase the importance, their own importance in the, in the story. That's human. But what is not uh, I think uh, uh, excusable was the fact that they then went and deliberately tried to suppress the story of what the revolutionaries in particular had done. And this is sad because of, <coughs> uh, 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 and particularly the systematic way that it is. This is very sad because as I will, as some of you have already started reading my book uh, about the revolutionaries, the revolutionaries actually were an extraordinary movement involving tens of thousands of people keeping up armed resistance to British occupation over half a century. This is not a, some small group of people as you may get the impression from reading our history books. The, the history books g haven't completely wiped them out because this is very recent history. So you can't actually wipe out the memory of Subhash Bose or Bhagat Singh or Chandrasekhar Azad or uh, Savarkar and so on. But you will get the impression from that that, you know, okay, there were these occasional acts of resistance, uh, heroic, etc. let them give a pat on the back, but in fact had no uh, uh, impact on the overall uh, unfolding of history or of the freedom struggle. This is absolutely not true. And as I've tried to show through the, uh, my book, the, you cannot even understand the nonviolent movement if you do not understand the armed resistance. In fact, inside the Congress itself, the uh, revolutionaries had a very powerful uh, voice, so much so that uh, um, the revolutionaries were able to elect their own, i.e. Netaji Subhash Bose, to the presidency against uh, the explicit opposition of Mahatma Gandhi. So even within the Congress, the revolutionaries were a very powerful block and were could quite capable of uh, winning elections. Incidentally, this wasn't just about Subhash Bose. This has happened 
many occasions before. One of those occasions, of course, Sri Aurobindo was involved. This is in the Surat elect, uh, 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 session of the Congress, um, where uh, <coughs> we are now told, those who at least uh, have, uh, delve into that period, we told that there was a lot of friction within the Congress uh, between the so-called uh, extremists and the so-called moderates. The use of those terms itself is interesting because you get the impression that the likes of uh, Lal Bal Pal were somehow extremists because they were demanding independence and uh, the moderates were nice, reasonable chaps because they were asking for small crumbs from the British table. So in my book, again, I have tried to change these terms and in fact use terms which Sri Aurobindo would use for them. <laughs> the Lal Bal Pal and of course he was from that same group uh, and an important person in that group by the way. Uh, Sri Aurobindo would call them the nationalists and he would call the opposing team the loyalists. So if you had to rewrite this history books, you would begin talking about that period and the tussle within the Congress as the tussle between the nationalists and the loyalists. Which brings me to another point I call collaborators, who actually collaborated actively with the British. After all, at even the peak of British rule in India, there were only a few hundred thousand of these people, an even smaller group would have been armed, a few more even in the administration. So there were, uh, at no point in time, were there a very large number of uh, 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 British officials, army, and other people to be able to dominate a country of our size and our population. The reason they were able to do this is because there were always was a sizable group of people who were collaborators. And sadly, again, very little is written about these col this collaborator class. Do remember that when firing was ordered on, uh, 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 on Indian protesters and freedom fighters during, let's say, uh, the uh, Naval Revolt of 1946, within living memory incidentally, then the firing was very often, I mean the firing was of course done by uh, Indian police or troops or whatever, but even the ordering was very often done by young officers of the in Imperial Police Service. So there was, and these young officers of the Imperial Police Service were Indians. Do remember this. So Indians have repeatedly collaborated with foreign occupiers to perpetuate our subjugation. This happened during the Turco-Mongol occupation of the country. And <coughs> Nandini was talking about it earlier. This also happened incidentally during British rule. And ironically, even after independence, so this is one of the very sad parts of, if you read the epilogue of my book, and I'm going to talk a little bit more before we open it up for Q&A, I think because I think some of the conversation will be much more interesting in a Q&A. But one of the things that comes through very clearly is that independence happens, the Nehruvians come to power. Yes, one, of course, they deliberately suppress the contributions of the revolutionaries. They slowly nudge them out of the history books or sort of present them as sort of random acts of individual violence. But what they do further is actually inexcusable. They, I don't know if you realize this, that when you visit the Port Blair and you see the cellular jail, what you see there today is just two wings of the cellular jail. But it was a much bigger complex with many other radials. What happened to those other radials? Well, they were pulled down. In fact, even the ones that you see today were nearly pulled down till at the last minute it was stopped. And therefore you have this little bit of it saved so that you can go and see it and remember what was done to these people. This memory was almost entirely wiped out. Same thing, ha si similar thing was attempted and successfully so in many other places. I'll give you another example. Delhi, Mamsi, Maulana Azad Medical College, yeah? It is built on the site of Delhi jail, where many revolutionaries were hanged. In the 1950s, it was decided that this jail would be closed and there were, uh, 
Now, there are many other places to build uh, 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 college, but they had to be built on that site. OK, fine. So when this was done, some old, there were still some old revolutionaries left. Unfortunately, uh, th so they went and t told the government and Nehru himself that, look, at least the part where the hangings used to happen should be converted into a memorial to the revolutionaries. This Nehru agreed, the government agreed. But then when actually the construction started, they demolished it. So this is how the memory of the revolutionaries was simply national uh, sort of consciousness very, very de deliberately. And instead, what happened is you see, for example, the INA uh, soldiers. They were not only not taken back into the Indian Army, they were not even given freedom fighter status for many decades afterwards. It's only in the 1970s that you know, there was, they were finally be given some recognition as freedom fighters. Many of them died in penury. Uh, this also happened with uh, <coughs> uh, the, the, uh, the mutineers uh, of the Royal Indian Navy uh, revolt. Uh, they all, many of them also were never, none of them were ever taken back into the, uh, into the Indian Navy. And again, many of them died in extreme penury. And this happened systematically, by the way, to many of the revolutionaries. And this is all, this again brings me back to what happened to them. Do remember the three provinces. Of course, there were revolutionaries across India. But the three provinces that provided, the three communities that provided the bulk of the revolutionaries, remember what will happen to them too. One was the Sikhs and Hindus of Punjab, Hindus of Bengal, and specifically the Brahmins of Maharashtra. These are the three communities that had provided a disproportionate number of the revolutionaries. And each case, see what happens to them. In Punjab and Bengal, they are partitioned. So at the moment that India became free, the revolutionaries who had sacrificed so much for India's freedom found that they themselves were foreigners in their own homes. So not only at the time of independence, you may ask, why, weren't the, why didn't the revolutionaries manage to you know, have a voice in post-independence India's politics? Well, this is what happened to them. All their top leaders were gone. Not a single one of their top leaders survived till independence. With Netaji went missing, died, whatever your belief may be. Uh, Raj Bihari Bose uh, and Sachin Sanyal, uh, uh, Bhagat Singh, Chandrasekhar Azad, all of them were dead. So the revolutionaries had no leadership and their homes had been lost. East Bengal and Lahore were major hubs of revolutionary activities. And if you read my book, you will find Dhaka and Lahore, etc., mentioned to them. Using the excuse that Godse was a Maharashtrian Brahmin, the entire community was essentially faced uh, genocide in some ways. So we all know about the eight, 1984 uh, riots in which the Sikhs were targeted. But do remember something very similar happened after Gandhi assassination. The entire Chitbhavan Brahmin community, more generally the Maharashtrian Brahmin community was targeted. Hundreds were killed, their homes were burnt, and we never hear about this genocide. A lot is talked about Savarkar. Let me tell you about what happened to his younger brother Narayan Savarkar, who was a, who was a great um, freedom fighter in his own right. I don't know, is Vikram here or not? Vikram Sampath. He's probably outside. But you can read more detail in his own, in his book, although I mention it in mine as well. Narayan Savarkar was dragged out of his house and stoned to death. He, di he died. He would then be essentially be in hospital for almost a year, never recovered and would die. Godse was hanged for the death of an assassination of Mahatma Gandhi. I want to know who was hanged for the killing of Narayan Savarkar. In fact, Vinayak Savarkar himself narrowly escaped the same fate. A big mob of Congress workers, great believers in Ahimsa, turned up at his house. 
and it and he was there with his kids young kids etc and his wife upstairs thankfully the mob was delayed long enough for the police to arrive otherwise the same thing would have happened to him and we hear long stories about how he was ap apologetic to the british and and so on why were the congress workers so afraid of this other narrative so much so that to this day they will make up utter bullshit stories about how he was in some way a collaborator of the british if he was a collaborator of the british they wouldn't have kept him in kala pani i can assure you that they would have kept him in the luxury wing of naini jail and they would not have kept him in house arrest for another for 13 years in ratnagiri so this story of the revolutionaries was not merely about the story their their history of resistance being suppressed but what happened afterwards in the way in which the, they themselves were pushed out of the of the national conversation systematically the provinces they came from were divided and partitioned they became homeless and leaderless and even when they were not suffering partition they were targeted specifically in, as you as i told you in the case of the chitpavan brahmins of maharashtra and pushed out of the conversation because they were seen as a threat to the continuation of a particular narrative so why did this happen why did independent india end up with this continuation it happened because once the nehruvians had come to par they discovered one they had to push out other alternatives to their hegemony and one of the groups they decided to uh, uh to uh, take on board was remember that collaborator class and of course the collaborator class was very very happy to be on board because <coughs> now you know they of course they were of course always good at collaborating that's what they did for a living and they were wondering what to do with themselves and here was an opportunity for con for continuity so as the british officials left those who had collaborated and joined the administration in various forms they were the one who benefited the most because they were got promoted and went up the stream and it is they and their descend immediate descendants and direct descendants who became the administrative and intellectual elite of india after independence this is the reason where you have a peculiar situation that the colonial era narrative that india was never a nation never a country etc was continued because you see this was very important for what the collaborators were telling themselves in any independent country they would have been thought of as being traitors but of course if you could say that india was never a country before 1947 then of course they could never have been a traitor to a country that did not exist so it is very important to their own narrative that india is not a country is not a nation before 1947 that is why it is important to say gandhi is the father of the nation because then 1947 ke pehle kuch nahi tha then you can have chacha to the nation then you can have damad to the nation so this is the importance of that narrative and also remember that a large number of british official colonial officials continued to serve in the government it is not that the next day they throw in ics officers of indian origin continued but also british origin much of the indian <coughs> armed forces was run by british officials well into the 50s the first indian naval chief only took office in 1958 11 years after india became independent in the name of continuity so in the name of continuity this entire regime continued that is therefore the collaborator class below them also continued they were very happy and they they were large so you when you go and dig a little bit just do a little bit of digging and you will be surprised how many people who are from this so called uh, sort of uh, uh, this uh, intellectual class 
have their origins in people who were who made their money by becoming contractors to the British or whose direct ancestors were working in the Imperial Police Service. Just go and look it up. You'll be shocked. Just do a little bit of Google search and you will, you'll be shocked. So of course, this particular narrative is important to this collaborator class. And many of these collaborator class then became the story writers about the whole thing. I, I have in my book, I've given the specific example of Yashpal. Those of you who read Hindi literature, revolutionary movement. Now it turns out there is more than adequate evidence to show that he was actually a police informant. And it was based on his information that Chandrasekhar Azad was trapped in Alfred Park in what was then called Allahabad and, and, and to kill himself. Even better, the revolutionaries of that time were hunting for him. I know that members of my family were hunting for him. And so because he were hunting for him, they, the British actually faked a gunfight in which nobody got hurt, interestingly. In, and then he was arrested and put in jail. I forget which jail, Bareilly or some such place. Now, no self-respecting revolutionary was ever sent to, to Bareilly jail. They were sent to Kalapani or Gonda or some such place. And even better, he was allowed to get married in jail and keep his wife in jail with him. <laughs> so these are the people who after independence then took on this mantle and became great, remembered as great uh, revolutionaries or great writers and thinkers and so on. Also interesting is what happened to many of the remnants <coughs> of uh, British uh, intelligence operations against the revolutionaries. So again, let me give you an interesting insight into this. Many of them have interesting afterlives. So for example, during the First World War, <coughs> or a little bit before the First World War, there was a very large movement called the Gadar Movement which involved a big network inside India, led by Raj Bihari Bose and Sachindranath Sanyal, but worldwide as well by likes of Lala Hardayal and, and many others. And the Sikhs were a very important part of this, particularly Sikhs in North America, who were operating out of a network of Gurudwaras, also in other places, UK, Singapore, etc., but particularly in North America. Now the British, basically decided to break this movement by infiltrating those Gurudwaras. And they actually, we even know the name of the British agent, Hopkinson, who was the person put in charge and was given a large amount of resources to infiltrate the Gurudwaras. And so he infiltrated those Gurudwaras and he created again a bunch of collaborators. And their basic premise or their aim was to create a split in the Sikh community and specifically spew venom against the Hindus and split them off from the Hindus and also from uh, the nationalist Hindus, uh, uh, nationalist movement in general. Now do remember at that time, <coughs> the Gadarites were aware that this was being done to them. And in many of the Gurudwaras of North America, there were gunfights between the collaborator loyalists and the nationalists. Uh, gunfights and the Gadarites then began to systematically kill the people who they being British informants. So then what happened? Of course the Gadarites fight back and many of these informants get killed. So one of these informants was Bela Singh who turns up in a Gurudwara and shoots a, a couple of people dead. And it is seen by many people and there's a court case and everybody knows that, you know, the British will ensure that uh, this is happens in British Columbia, by the way. So everybody knows that the British Columbia justice system is going to somehow find a way to free Bela Singh. So the court case is going on and Hopkinson is supposed to come and bear witness on behalf of Bela Singh. So when he is entering the court, the, the witness box or whatever, 
An Agadarite Sikh called Mewa Singh stands up, pulls out a revolver and shoots him dead in court. Now, nobody in India knows the story. Nobody in India probably has heard of Mewa Singh. But these were the kinds of people that were there. Now, Bela Singh, despite, of course, Mewa Singh is captured, he's hanged. Bela Singh, of course, is exonerated. But he knows that they are hunting for him. So it, eventually it becomes so difficult for him to live in British Columbia, he actually escapes back to Punjab, which is he thinks is safer. But then he is ultimately, I think, hunted down in Hoshiarpur and killed by the revolutionaries. But sadly, this infiltration of Gurudwaras continues even after the death of Hopkinson. And in case you're wondering, why is it that Canada of all places is the hub of the Khalistani movement? Well, let me tell you, the, the founder of the Khalistani movement is Hopkinson. So this is how this entire thing starts out. So there are all these remnants. Another interesting thing that is often forgotten is that <coughs> Till about 1930, there were virtually no revolutionaries who had anything to do with Marxism. When, you know, very often you will hear, oh, the revolutionaries were Marxists. Actually, no, they were not. Uh, many of them may have been today considered Hindu nationalists of anything. Bhagat Singh indeed became, in the very end of his life, and by the way, it couldn't have been a very li long life. He was only 23 years old when he was hanged. But the, towards the very end, he did embrace uh, some, some amount of Marxist ideas. But it's interesting that in his very famous tract, Why I Am an Atheist, he himself writes that I am literally the only Marxist in the entire movement. In other words, his movement was not Marxist. The top leader of his movement, Sachindranath Sanyal, was vehemently anti-Marxist, as was Raj Bihari Bose and many others, and Sri Aurobindo as well. So, the movement and its leaders were anti-Marxist of anything. So it's only in the 1930s you begin to see some Marxism sort of begin to spread in the revolutionary fold. And that happens interestingly. One is, of course, <coughs> some part of the, 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 some group of revolutionaries ended up in Russia after the First World War because they had nowhere to escape. And they were indoctrinated by the Soviets into this. So that, lean, and therefore, uh, you have the CPI being formed in Tashkent. But even that is not really the source of the, uh, re, uh, the, the, the Marxist movement in India. The real source of the Marxist movement of India is very, very curious. And again, I have collected lots of interesting evidence of this. It comes from British jail, jailers handing out Marxist literature to revolutionaries in British jails. Now, why on earth would they be doing this? Now, it, this is interesting. And again, as I said, there are many examples of this, that of the British jailers giving out these because they wanted to cause a split in the revolutionary movement and wean them away from the nationalists. So they thought that communist literature was a good way of causing a split. Now, am I just coming up with some sort of a conspiracy theory? No, there's more than adequate evidence that this happened. Also interesting is that now that these people had become communists, where did they end up? They ended up in the CPI. Now the CPI had been formed in Russia, but in the 1930s it was functioning in India. Interestingly, under the control of British double agents. We even know their names. One of them was called Rajni Palme Dutt. Please read up on him. Okay, Rajni Palme Dutt grew up in Cambridge, he was half Swedish. <coughs> By the way, related to Olaf Palme, he was killed later. And uh, Bengali, he was, he and his brother were very much involved in the communist movement in, in, in Britain. But it's quite interesting if you read his correspondence with various people, including Nehru, it was very clear he was serving British interests. And of course, this became a very useful thing because in the Second World War, the communists would collaborate with the British against the revolutionaries. Now, yes, there were some revolutionaries who did take on Marxist ideas, but continued to be suspicious of imperialist uh, and British and Russian 
uh, interference. Now that lineage of the revolutionary movement wasn't in the CPI. It ended up in something called the Revolutionary Socialist Party. Now that party has almost died out today in modern, in today's India, but was a reasonably um, uh, uh, um, large party uh, into the 50s, 60s, even into the 80s. So the Revolutionary Socialist Party is the remnants of uh, that lineage of, uh, uh, of the Marxist lineage of the revolutionaries. They were originally called the Anishalan Marxists, okay, deriving from the Anishalan Samiti of, of again, Sri Aurobindo. But another, it's interesting, on the very other end of the ideological spectrum, the other remnant of the Anushilan Samiti is guess who? RSS. The RSS was founded by Hegewer, who was himself the Nagpur head of the Anushilan Samiti. Uh, he had been, he, had, he was very much a part of the Anushilan Samiti. He was in National Medical College in Kolkata. Uh, he started out as being a courier for guns and other literature and other things, and he had interestingly a code name, Cocaine. Uh, anyway, he comes back, he does various things during the First World War, trying to instigate revolts. Ultimately, he leaves uh, the mainstream revolutionary movement and he sets up the RSS. Uh, very interestingly, and I'm going to end with this, the pamphlet or the design of the RSS uh, is again derived from writings of Sri Aurobindo. Please read a short 18-page pamphlet called Bhavani Mandir. Have you read? How many of you have read Bhavani Mandir? There are a few here. Read it from end to end. It's only 18 pages, and you will immediately see where the f the the, the uh, broad design of the RSS comes from. Um, with that, let me stop and open it up for Q&A. Such an interesting talk, Sanjeev. Just a quick question. There has been an attempt to say that Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose was himself uh, socialist, if not, you know, didn't have Marxist ideas. What is uh, your take on that? So Netaji was essentially a pragmatist. Uh, we don't, he didn't have very strong views on, mo uh, on how society should be arranged, although he did participate in creating a planning board in the Congress while he was the Congress president. But if you read his own writings, it's quite interesting how he thinks of the right and the left. So in his own writings, and do remember that the term socialist did not have the connotations of economic, economics that we have well into the 1930s. It was a generic term that many people used, even though you wouldn't call them socialist or the left. The idea of socialism was anybody who kind of, or, or the left, was anybody who was had kind of radical views about uh, pushing back against the existing colonial order. So in his own writings, you find Netaji refers to the likes of Lala Lajpat Rai, Bal Gangadhar Tilak, Sri Aurobindo, even Vivekanand as belonging to the left. So, be very, very careful about the use of the term left. Left meant radical, not necessarily associated with um, sort of all these terms that we now have of, of particular kind of economic planning or, uh, uh, social, uh, or secularism and so on. The left was a generic term, so many of the characters who we now consider from the right, would have, he would have considered from the left. The term socialism as a, itself was a very vague term. By the mid-30s, it does begin to take some forms, particularly because of the, uh, the growth of the so Soviet Union and so on. So you begin in the 30s, beginning to see some sort of contours of what we would recognize as socialist left. Um, but again, it would have been quite vague. There were many people using all kinds of uh, terms more generally about it. So be very, very careful about using it, and in any case, uh, Netaji himself was a pragmatist. Um, I mean, if he was that ideological about it, he wouldn't have 
uh, been willing to ally either with uh, the, the fascists of Italy or Nazis or, or imperialist Japan and so on. Uh, he was, as far as he was concerned, his first agenda was uh, freeing India. And he, he was willing to ally with whoever was necessary uh, in terms of doing so. He was not at all ideological about it. And of course, in personal life, he was a very cutter shakta. That is well known. Thanks for the mind-boggling session. I have two quick questions. One, I'm very happy that we are waking up now, but are we too late? Second question, uh, Anand and Vikram Sampath were talking about how Gandhi was a fiction. And even his contemporaries were, you know, uh, they were promoting the Mahatma picture. Why was so? Even Patel didn't uh, agree with, no, though he didn't agree with him, he budgeted for uh, giving space to Nehru. Why so? So, of course, there's a great amount of deification of, uh, uh, of Gandhi that happens um, while he was alive and, of course, very much after his, his assassination, which, was even, which, by the way, was quite convenient to us uh, also to uh, the narrative. Uh, so the building up of Gandhi is uh, very much a uh, part of what happened. But do remember that within the Congress, forget the revolutionaries, there were many, many others who were quite uncomfortable with Gandhi's deification. Since you mentioned Sardar Patel, let me tell you that included Vithal Bhai Patel, who was his elder brother, who was quite suspicious of Gandhi. And, uh, it in, uh, and there was an entire faction in the, Gandhi in, the 19, in the Congress in the 1920s called the Swarajists, who were uncomfortable with Gandhi, which included C.R. Das, interestingly, it, and Vithal Bhai Patel, but it also interestingly included Motilal Nehru, Nehru, uh, Motilal Nehru's switch over to the Gandhians happens in the end of the 1920s and it happens interestingly because Gandhi first helped him to become the president of the party but then also arranged for his son to be his immediate successor. In a sense he was bought out as a result of that politicking. This is exactly what Gandhi tries to do with Subhash Bose as well in the 1930s. That's why, by the way, the first time that Subhash Bose becomes president, it's actually with Gandhi's blessings. Where it goes wrong is that Subhash Bose, having become president, first of all, doesn't toe the Gandhian line in what he does. But then, uh, in, and then he says, look, my, what I've been doing hasn't yet been finished. I want another term. And that is where it, you know, the friction comes from. So, I am not here to say that Gandhi did not have any contributions to the freedom struggle. That would be too extreme. There were many contributions to the, to the freedom struggle and Gandhi, even many of the revolutionaries accepted that he had a contribution. By the way, whether you read Sachin Sanyal's writings or even uh, Netaji's writings, but at the same time, they were not so enamored by him to think that everything he did was right and sort of deified him. They saw him as a an important political leader who was part of the whole spectrum that led to Indian freedom. Yes. So it's really exhilarating uh, whatever you are telling, but the point is that ki this literature would be read by most probably the people like us uh, who are no longer going to school. When these things are going to come to the school, I have a kid who is in 10th standard. Actually, I have a kid who is in 10th standard. So, when this is going to happen, another question just short. Uh, it is also said that Nehru informed about uh, the presence of uh, the revolutionary who was killed uh, in that bag. Uh, is it true? Because he had just met Nehru just before he was killed for asking for money. Well, Nehru did indeed uh, know that uh, Chandrasekhar Azad was in Allahabad on that day, so that is true. But we do not have any direct evidence to suggest that he had provided that information. The best evidence we have is that it was Yashpal and another guy, uh, I forget his name, something Tiwari. Uh, but mostly Yashpal who provided that information. So th that is the best information we have. So I'm not going to... Uh, speculate until I find some other new evidence on this matter. As far as textbooks is concerned, well, I have been pushing for this for a very long time, uh, so I can't comment on the activities of another ministry or NCRT, but let me say that I have been pushing for it for a long time. I'm told that they are on the job.
Sanjeev, thank you. Coming back to Netaji Bose, uh, what is your take on, on Gumnami Baba? Uh, so I just wanted to know. I mean, I'm just trying well, to... Well, I actually don't have a particular view. I'm intrigued by the idea of Gumnami Baba. Um, I wouldn't completely uh, write it off because he was a very interesting man, uh, Netaji, and he was quite capable of doing something like this. Uh, uh, and by the way, he had in earlier life once run away from home to become a monk. So he was capable of doing something completely uh, out of the box. But am I somebody who spends a great amount of time thinking about this? Uh, no. Uh, the reason for that, at least as far as my book is concerned, do remember that uh, for the purposes of my book, he is not, his afterlife is not irre relevant. He, for, for as far as the freedom struggle and the revolutionary movement is concerned, whether he goes missing or dies in that plane crash, subsequently he doesn't seem to play an important role, or at least we don't seem to have any evidence of him playing a, 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 an important role. So consequently, I take, take an agnostic view about the matter. Whatever happened to him, as far as the story is concerned, he was dead. hand because otherwise I wouldn't know whom to give the mic to. One more question from me. Since yeah. you are part of the government and uh, the revolutionaries uh, are coming out in the book, as a part of Ajadika Amrits Mahosav, uh, what are the steps that the government is taking to uh, elaborate the contributions of our revolution? So many things are being done. I mean, some are small, some are big, but certainly what we have done is as part of the Azadi Ka Mahots, uh, Amrit Mahotsav, we have celebrated a much wider array of freedom fighters than would have been the case in the last 75 years. So whether it's in terms of putting a Netaji statue on Kartavya Mark, and you know if you go there and see it, effectively what happens is that all subsequent Republic Day parades are done effectively to Netaji taking the salute. Um, similarly, if you have visited Kolkata and gone to the Victoria Memorial and visit, gone to the insides of it, you will see that it's been converted to being Biplobi Bharat Museum, which is to Netaji and the other revolutionaries, and I had some small role in getting that done. Um, there is, um, similarly, we are finally beginning to hear uh, uh, names such as Birsa Munda um, and so on, who are an important part of the conversation. Uh, we, ma many people are completely ignorant that the Manipuri had a very important role in our freedom struggle. We, we, we're probably utterly ignorant about it. Uh, they put up the last, yeah, just, yeah, they put up the last true um, resistance of any Indian traditional elite to the British in the 1890s. And the Manipuri royal family was then sent off to Kalapani before cellular jail was created and they were put in a place <coughs> what for a long time was called Harriet Hill. Just a few months ago, uh, Home Minister went to uh, Andamans and he renamed that hill as Manipur Hill. <laughs> Similarly, there is a cell, there, was, there has been now for some years a cell in, um, uh, in uh, cellular jail that was dedicated to uh, uh, Savarkar, there now is another cell that is now dedicated to Sashyendranath Sanyal, who had been sent there twice. He's the only uh, person to have been sent twice to Kalabani, <laughs> went for five years and then subsequently for ten years. So, small things are being done, but in some ways this is not a government effort. This has to be a national effort and it is coming through in many, many small ways across the country. Even the movie RRR, fictionalized as it may be, brings out the memory of Aluri Sitarama Raju. Many pe of people in this room may have never heard of him before this. And while I don't think he went to the governor's party and danced like that, uh, it is a fact that he had a very remarkable life and a remarkable resistance to British colonial occupation of this country. So I think we are, these stories are coming back. And of course, there is a longer history of uh, resistance to uh, foreign occupation of this country, that too is coming back. We are now beginning to hear about the likes of Lasit Borpukon or Durgavati and so on, which we simply did not hear. Even Rajdi, with now his 
uh, even somewhat reluctantly is writing about Vijayanagar of all places. And maybe he has twisted, I haven't read the book, and I'm sure he has attempted to give it some secular twist. But the fact of the matter is, people are unable to keep these stories hidden any longer. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You have four more minutes. Sanjeev, you have four I more have minutes. I have four more minutes? Yes. Okay, One okay, okay. So I can ask some more questions. Sorry, I can answer some more questions. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, there has been a rewriting of history in these days. Is this too late or uh, is this the right time? There's no right time or too late. It's about, about every generation to go and dig. <coughs> the point is proper scholarship is needed, first of all. Our purpose is not to replace one bunch of lies with another bunch of lies. So proper scholarship is needed for the first time this is being attempted. Some of it is happening in academia. Finally, archaeological survey is also being slowly uh, sort of uh, pushed ahead to begin to do new digs after a long time. You're also seeing people from the outside of the mainstream academic uh, histor history uh, mafia beginning to write books about uh, history. Uh, of course, with great amounts of complaints that we have not been, uh, that the, that, that the the academia didn't have an opportunity to brainwash us, uh, and therefore that is taken uh, as a, uh, against us. But anyway, the point is, new facts are being dug up, being presented, these stories are being retold. And very importantly, these stories are finally beginning to reach the general consciousness as well. Look at the number of things that are being done. You know, Amazon Prime and OT other OTT platforms have, for example, recently come Udham. Right? Growing up, I had actually never heard of Udham Singh. Hopefully, the next generation very much knows who Udham Singh is. I mean, and the incredible thing he did. Uh, he avenged um, Jallianwala Bagh massacre after two decades. And so on and so forth. So these stories are coming out. Whether, as I said, the, the, the specific period of the revolutionaries, but also the longer history. Um, there's a lot of renewed interest in, for example, Shivaji that is happening. Uh, <coughs> Uday Kulkarni has written extraordinary books on the Peshwa period. Um, you're beginning to see histories for uh, being written about other characters as well. So I think there is a revival of interest in our own history uh, being written by ourselves. And, uh, you know, uh, in the past, a book on Aurangzeb with no references at all in it would have simply passed through without anyone challenging it. Today, it's being challenged. And you also have a situation where even those who, for example, even today, you'll find books of Charles Allen everywhere. I mean, I find it extraordinary that a country like India accepts a blatantly racist histories and books written by the likes of Chal Allen and they'll find them in ordinary bookshops. And I'm going to end by saying this. Just read a book he's written called Coromandel, okay? On the very first page, he writes something quite bizarre. So it's supposed to be a maritime history of the Coromandel course. He basically starts it, that chapter, by saying that the Indians are a strange people that ne lived next to this ocean and had no interest in the ocean. What? So in one swell sweep, he wipes out our entire maritime history. And then this allows him to only concentrate on the colonial period. I mean, the blatantness with which history is done. He's written a book on Ashoka, where there is a 20-page segment on Ashoka himself. The rest of the book is about how great the British were in having rediscovered him. I mean, it's just astounding. But anyway, that's how things are for the first time. Till a decade ago or so, we would just not have questioned him. In fact, he would have been brought to literature festivals and feted as a great Indo Indologist. Today, we mock him. That's the change. Thank you very much.
Okay, we are not having a break now. Um, in the next session, we have professor and scientist Gautam Devi Raju of IISC Bangalore. He is also an author and will speak to us about his book, Bharat India 2.0. Kindly take your seats now, please. This is not a break. We're going to have a talk now. Oh, okay. Chalo. Thank you very much indeed. And over the course of the next one hour, I would like to talk about my book, Bharat India 2.0. Now, <clears throat> the picture over there was actually created several years after partition. And uh, it's very significant that we are meeting here in Puducherry a place where that picture was created. And uh, I picked up this little book in the bookshop of the ashram yesterday. And the mother writes here, India is not the earth, rivers, and mountains of this land. Neither is it a collective name for the inhabitants of this country. India is a living being, as much living as, say, Shiva. India is a goddess, as Shiva is a god. If she likes, she can manifest in human form. Now, the only issue I have to take up with Mother here is that instead of India, I would like to say Bharat. And that is the purpose of my book. It is meant for young people of this country to take something that we call India now and make it into Bharat. And that map is really Bharat Varsha. It is the extended domain where a certain thought stream exists and has existed for well nigh 5,000 years. Now, all this is serious stuff. Now, let's take something much lighter and much more familiar. We're not very far from lunchtime. And so I want to talk about something which we eat. Now, the question I'm going to ask you is, which of these following mangoes is your favorite mango? Now, you're going to say, oh, no. He's again asking the silly question which everyone starts asking in February or March. And then everybody starts shouting and uh, starts getting angry with each other. But anyway, I'm going to mention four mangoes, which are very popular in the four states I have lived in, in 65 of my 70 years. The other five years, of course, I lived in Kalapani, which is USA. So <laughs> let, let, let's, let's not talk about those five years. 65 years we'll talk. So first one I'm going to say is Neelam. Second one is Apus. Uh, third one is Banganpalli. And fourth is uh, Malgova. So you can decide which of the four big cities 
of India, south of the Vindhyas, I've lived in these last 65 years. Now, this is what I would call a sort of first order kind of an argument. But then, this is not enough. There are many people here who have lived in these places and will mention some other mango. You will not choose these things at all. So the question then which arises is, what is a mango? What is a mango? Mango is something, it's a fruit. I think, are we in agreement about that? It's a fruit? Yes or no? Because I'm, I'm going to come back and get, get to you with this. If you say yes, I'm going to question you later. Is it a fruit? I would say it's nice. Would you agree with that? It's nice? Very nice, very nice. I would say it is yellow. Yellow. Yellow? Green, yellow. Okay, 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 okay. Then I'm going to say it's sweet. Sweet. No, yes. There's a lot of, lot of discussion already on what a mango is. Then I'm going to say that it's something we cut and then eat. Not necessarily not. So there's some problems here with this definition. What is a mango? So I thought it was a nice simple definition. A fruit which is nice, yellow, sweet, cut, eat. Already there seems to be a lot of, it's like Rajya Sabha or something. <laughs> you know, not good. Now, first order is these four mangoes. Now, second order, the last of these four cities where I've lived. I've said Malgova. But you go to any common fruit shop in Bangalore, you'll get a variety called Raspuri. Now, for those of you who've lived in Bangalore, you'll realize that Raspuri, is, it's actually, I like it better than Malgova, by the way. But uh, the thing about the Raspuri is, rather than the taste, it is the smell of that Raspuri which is very interesting. So in this definition which I've given, the smell is not there. How does a mango smell? And then we'll go to what we call third order perturbation. Now you take this uh, kilimuka, which is here in this part. You take the raw, raw kilimuka. Now, it's cut nicely and put, they put salt and chili powder and you eat it on the beach. Now, this is not sweet, but it's nice. Okay? So, what do you say? You can cut it, not sweet. Then you go to East Godavari district, you will get something called cherukurasam. Now, that you can't cut. It's only pulp inside. It's yellow, very sweet. You can't cut problem. Then we go to fourth order. What about this Vadumanga? Now I know some of you are thinking about Vadumanga and Tahir Shadam. You are thinking about lunch already. Hey, isn't it? So what happens with this Vadumanga? It is that same Kelimuku which is taken when it is raw. I think they call it Tota Puri in other parts of the country. Same thing. So they take it and then they pickle it in brine. It's still a mango, no? No doubt that it's a mango, I hope. No, no. So, that is the fourth order. Then fifth order, this is a difficult one. What about manga inji? <laughs> question. Big question. Now, botanically, it's not a mango and it is not ginger. It's more like turmeric. But it's yellow. You cut it. Quite yellow. There is a definite mango tea feel and taste. Huh. So is it a mango or it's not? And then finally, is there anyone here who has lived any sixth order perturbation? Now this becomes a delusionary. Anybody here who has lived in Hyderabad for any length of time? Because I've lived there 30 years. One month. Until you live in Hyderabad for 10 years, you don't understand that place. Now, there is, there is a fruit there. It's, it's sold as Bainishan. Now, Bainishan, if you look at Google, it says it's the same as Banganpalli. And we have lots of debates on whether Bainishan and Banganpalli are the same or not. It's a small version of Banganpalli. And the taste is somewhat sharper. People say I'm nuts when I say that these two are different. It's kind of imaginary the difference between Benishan and Banganpalli. So you see, this, so this whole idea of what a mango is, 
Shall we then define a term called mangoness? Mangoness. What is mangoness? Does it cover all these varieties that I've talked about so far? So the definition is not very proper. We can't give a proper definition, but we all know what mangoness is. And then suddenly I'm going to put a foreign word in all this nice discussion of mangoes. That is apple. Huh? Looks like a very foreign word, no, suddenly, with due apologies to people in Himachal and Kashmir. But this apple, apple-ness is different from mango-ness, which is also different from banana-ness. So the problem with definitions, you know, in my chemistry career, I've dealt with nomenclature all the time and got involved in many disputes regarding nomenclature. So I'll tell you, with this mango-ness, I'm going to just ask a small additional question. What is that is the definition of Hindu. So just like this India is one, Bharat is like a big mango with all these things and places. Manga inji actually is eaten more in Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia than it is eaten in India. That's why that map of the mother and all that is quite realistic. So this idea of Bharat is something which is inextricably linked with Sanatana Dharma. And it covers a whole landmass between Kandahar and Mandalay. A few months ago, I was participating in a Twitter spaces where there were people from Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh. People were talking. It was a very good-natured discussion. And people were saying these four countries are the same. And finally, somebody from Pakistan said, forget it. He said, hawa ek hi hai. It is this hawa which we are talking about. This hawa is like mangoness. You can't define it. So any attempts to define Hindutva and so on and so on, I don't think Mr. Aravindan is here. Is he here anywhere in the audience? No, he's not. But I was really, really enthused when in his very handsome review of my book, which is available there, it is the third printing of my book, and all the reviews have been put there. So you can read Arvindan's review there. He said, I mean, I was really overwhelmed when I saw his comment. He said, after Savarkar, I have given the crispest definition of Hindutva. And he was writing a big book on Hindutva, which is he's going to talk about this afternoon. For somebody like him to say something like this, I said, my. I mean, I seem to have struck a right chord somewhere with Mr. Arvindan. So you see, this is what Bharat is all about. So where Bharat begins, where it ends, where Sanatana Dharma begins, it's all the same thing. And it is this idea, I think, that I have tried to capture in my book. And I'm not going to tell you too much about the book. For that, you'll have to buy it and read it. So I know. So I'm, it's the philosophy, the thinking stream that I went through as a professor of chemistry, quite a, I'm told I'm quite a big professor of chemistry, that I don't know. But uh, what kind of thought stream does a scientist go through and to analyze this? So the early part, the first half of the book has to do with the constitution. Mostly it has to do with the constitutional history of India uh, 50 years before independence. So that's the chapter one. So you read that. Chapter two is the constitution itself, how and why it got written the way it got written. The fact that these people who wrote the constitution were all well-meaning people. They were not uh, tukde tukde gang. No, no, none of them were. And uh, to summarize, there are seven things, points, where they spent the maximum time discussing. These may not be big things, but these were the maximum time that they spent. First point, that there's no mention of God in the Constitution. No. Second, there is no mention of Sanatana Dharma and that it is the warp and woof of this country. No mention. Nothing. The third is that the difference between the socially deprived classes of this country and the socially advantaged was too much at the time of independence. And somehow, we had to do something about bridging this gap. 
The fourth, the uneasy relationship between the union government and the state governments. The fact that there is a need to balance a strong center with self-respecting states. The fifth, <laughs> this was the most amusing and longest discussion. What should, what if any should be the national language? And even more lengthy, by the way, was whether we should use Arabic numerals or Devanagari numerals. So this was very, very lengthy, silly discussion. And uh, a fellow from Mysore actually started reeling off the names of the chemical elements in Canada. All sorts of things, funny things I, I read in that, those debates. The sixth one, again, let's think about what happened three or four days ago. Whether there should be a Rajya Sabha or not. And by the way, most of the members did not want an upper house. And it was some kind of an uh, illusion of house of lords or something. That seemed to finally, you know, it was very unconvincing. Those who were opposing the upper house uh, gave a better account of themselves than those who supported the upper house. And finally, the last of the seven points was, is our constitution a cut and paste effort or is it something original? So these were, I'm just enumerating. But in the end, there were three fault lines which I could make out of all this. First is, are both Hindus and Muslims equally comfortable and happy with this country as it is today? My answer is, both groups are not happy. Hindus feel that the state is going against them. The Muslims feel either patronized or they feel that the state is bluffing and secretly it wants to go and kill all of them. So neither group is happy. Second, is upper caste other castes? Do either group feel happy? No. Upper caste feels that they have nowhere to go. They will run away to America, Bulgaria, Moldavia, any country they will go. Hmm. Those who are not upper caste feel somehow that they are getting patronized once again. So they feel again, once again, the whole thing is a kind of a bluff. And even if they get all these advantages, jobs, medical college seats and all that, they are going to be still looked down upon. So that's not gone. Third, the center state. Center feels that the states are an unnecessary nuisance, troubling them all the time. The states, on the other hand, feel that they have to go with a beggar bowl to the center who is going to dole out small sums of money, if they dole out anything at all. So nobody is happy in the present situation, in these three fault lines. So this then leads, as a scientist, I'll say, there must be, must be something wrong with the original document, which is the blueprint for the way in which this country is run. Because at the end of 75 years, if nobody is particularly happy, we are not very unhappy, let me put it that. But we are not exuberantly happy. And unless all the people of the country are exuberantly happy, it will not have that extra X factor that will make it a world power. Every country that became a world power, everybody in that country felt that they were part of the effort. This is simply not there. Now, this is about the book itself. And let me summarize by saying, and then this will also cover chapter three, which again, you will have to buy the book and read, that this is a constitution that is meant for a nation state. And we are not a nation state. We are a civilizational state. So chapter three will tell you what a nation state is all about. And for that, you must look seriously at European history. Because that is where the origins of the nation state come, the 30 years war and the Treaty of Westphalia, Metternich, the Congress of 1815, and World War I. In my opinion, World War I is far, far, far more important than World War II in deciding the fate of the world and what happened. So that will give you of the first three chapters. Now, coming back to this mango business, you see, I'm still thinking about mangoes. This whole thing about mango defines this whole concept of what is called diversity. We are a very diverse country. It is our strongest point. Any country which became very powerful and became important stressed only its strongest point. It suppressed all the weaker points. 
we have a particularly masochistic instinct of stressing our weakest points. Muslim, Hindu, Hindu, Muslim, all the time. Ovesi, somebody else, that Yati fellow, Narsingh Anand or something his name. Then upper caste, lower caste, all the time, nothing else. Brahminical patriarchy, all these sorts of things. Then center state, Mamata, Stalin, Sarat Pawar. We should not spend so much time discussing all these characters. They are all victims of the present situation. They are not the causes of anything. So we spend, this, is, this is what generally is, seems to be going on at the present time. And so diversity. In fact, I will go even one step further. Because we were always diverse, I think even the original statements of Sanatana Dharma, the Vedas and all were written in that way. They are written in a way which optimizes diversity. The whole idea of Purushartha. The fact that there are many different approaches, there may be many goals that different kinds of people have in life. Everybody in this country doesn't want to get into IITG and then go to IIM, Ahmedabad. No, no. That's wrong. And the more and more we start thinking on those lines, because I've seen all these IITs, that's part and parcel of my mainline profession. IIT G and IIM Ahmedabad are not the answer for everybody. People, different people want to do different things, and they should be allowed to do different things. That is the meaning of diversity. Optimization of diversity means what? It is because of diversity that we have Sanatana Dharma in the present form that it is. I'll say that. It is not that Sanatana Dharma has led to diversity. We are always diverse. We love diversity. All these mangoes. You can go and have lots of debates and discussions on what is this character, Professor Desiraju, talking. And somebody, one of you will produce a new kind of mango that I have not thought of, which even goes beyond Manga Inji and Benishan. So we love this. So this is a way... Diversity, when you start optimizing diversity, I think that's when we will see a new India, we will see Bharat. Now, Ajit, if I could have the, for this, this one, this slide, you may be wondering what is, what's behind this, now you'll see. This, this one, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, this one. Can you bring it a bit to the front, maybe? Yeah, thanks so much. See, these strange looking pictures exist in the book. So you buy the book, you'll see these pictures. <laughs> you, can t you can take it back and look at it. Now, what is the chemistry professor showing, you know, pictures like this in something serious, Bharat, India, civilizational, Vedas, Dakshina Murti. What, 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 is, what has this got to do with any of this stuff? Now see, this is Bharat, okay? The last picture here. This beautiful picture from Kashmir. And uh, that shows the diversity of Bharat. You've got clouds. Yeah, Maria, you can come a little bit in the front and see. You've got clouds, you've got mountains, you've got clouds, you've got a meadow, you've got flowers, so many things in one picture. That is the beauty and diversity of Bharat. Now, there is an impressionist technique called pointillism, which was popularized in the late 19th century by a chap called Sura, and helped by his assistant, Sinyak, Paul Sinyak, and uh, Sura, what they did was they said, there's a beautiful picture which I've seen many times in the Art Institute of Chicago, which is called uh, Dimanche Apre, Apre Midi. And actually it is now Dimanche Apre Midi actually. <laughs> a curious coincidence. So Dimanche Apre Midi, all these Parisians were going to a little island outside Paris. So you see the women with their parasols. You know, it's a picture that is this huge, and it is the high point of the Art Institute Chicago, 
Many, many, many times have I seen that picture. And it's, if you go near the picture and have a look at it, you see lots of colored dots. You don't see colors. Normally, when you think of a painting, you'll think of people painting with some colors, no? No, it's got little, little colored dots of absolutely obscure colors. The whole idea in pointillism is that there is a perception of color as you go away from a picture which doesn't depend on the colors that have been used, but the colors of little dots and the way in which they are put together. Now, there are very nice commercial software, simple to use, where you can take any picture you want and make a pointillist image out of it, which is what I've done. Now, these are the sizes of the colored dots. So you can see this is India with 28 states. So this could be Tamil Nadu, that could be Kashmir. Could be, could be anything. But you can see the diversity of the country based on the differences in colors. But then see something very funny happens. Actually, in the book, you will see Surya's original picture of the Marsha Premidi. Then you will understand exactly what is happening. There is a certain stretch where there's a gray kind of a gravel or something. The gray actually is not painted gray. It is painted orange, white, blue. So many colors are there, which give an impression of gray when you hold the picture away from you. So there is an impression like mango ness. There is an impression of the whole thing based on diversity. And uh, I can do take the same software. Very simple to use this software. Huh? There is no, not, not at all difficult. Even I could do it. Now, make the dots smaller, and then you'll see the colors. The colors here roughly match the colors here, but not exactly. Not exactly. Like there's a red over here. The red seems to have vanished somehow. You know, you'll be asking why. Then this is India with about 40 to 50 states. The diversity is there, but you don't see the whole picture. The whole picture, the beauty of Bharat is not seen. And then suddenly you come to 75 states. And lo and presto, you can make, the, make out the outlines of the picture. So what was not visible here and here suddenly comes out here. Now I can start increasing the number of dots, you see. But all this is unnecessary, this and this. This is like those uh, delusionary things, you know, Benishan and Bandhanvali, nothing. It's actually nonsense. And in fact, this is something like, say, from 300 states, 750 states. Actually, Gandhi wanted 750 states. Yeah, he did. This is one of the other things he did in 1946. Something called the Gandhian Constitution <laughs> was written by a chap called Sriman Narayan Agarwal. But if you read Gandhi's preface to that constitution, it is clear that he wrote every single word of it. <laughs> so he wanted 750 states. Can you imagine? I mean, OK, 28, I have said, is too small. But I mean, 750. Then I will say that Hotel Atiti should be one state, and you know, Hotel Residency should be another state, and so on. So I mean, there's got to be a limit to all this. So the whole idea here is that there is an optimum number of states. Now, what is this optimum number? Optimum number, actually, I was in collaboration with a guy in the UK, an Indian, uh, to get an analytical explanation for 75, which is, all this is given in chapter 4, which is the crux of the book. Because as a scientist, I am not happy with just stating a problem. Chapters 1 and 2 sort of state the problem, and chapter 3, civilizational, some explanation, going round and round and round. But scientists want solutions. They may be wrong solutions, but we want a solution. No, the reason why we want a solution is it's up to somebody else to suggest a better solution. But we are always looking. No point looking at the past, yaar. Some Muslims did this, Christians did that. What were we doing, sitting and allowing all these guys to do all these things for so many years? See, if the, our thing was so nice and everything so great, we discovered everything. There was one language in India that appeared even before the universe. Ah, yeah, uh, 
not far away from this union territory. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so we, 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 we are very great, no? Yeah, we are very great. Then why did we allow all these things to happen? Kya hua hum logon ko? No point see, see, thinking about the past all the time. Take the past, try to get some ideas about what happened, and notice how horrible we are doing at the present that Rajya Sabha. This is not good. It's not good under any circumstance. There's no point. There's no point. You know, this is, this is what we're all thinking people. We are not some dummies. I mean, was it okay? Did you feel good? Did any of you feel good? We have an elected prime minister of this country sitting in parliament and saying something serious. I don't care if it is Modi or XYZ, anybody. This elected prime minister of the country. He's standing there and making a long speech, motion of thanks, address, budget and all that. People are shouting non-stop and not letting him speak. Is this okay? I don't think it is something to laugh about. Thik nahi to thik nahi hai. I think we should not hesitate to say it and speak up. So, such being the case, I think there is a reason why we need these 75 states. And Ajit, if you can then come and bring that and put it over here. Those of you who have not seen the book, this is also there in the book. These are the 75 states. This is, this is my conception of the 75 states of Bharat. And this is not based on an analytical model. Professor Desiraju didn't come out with this just from the top of his head. I have used geographical, historical, social, cultural, strategic, so many viewpoints. And at the end of the day, if all these viewpoints do not satisfy, there is a sheer administrative convenience of having smaller states. This has been spoken about from the time of the 1956 Panikar Commission on States Reorganization. So chapter 4 then goes through these 75 states and gives a rationale and justification for forming these states. And the, the most important thing, of course, I have explained to you here, is that diversity, this optimizes diversity. It is, sub 75 is a sufficient number to show the true picture of Bharat, okay? And it is not unnecessarily large like these things. Anything less than 75 will not do. Anything more than 75 is unnecessary. 75 means, scientists we are, plus minus we will say, plus minus 5, plus minus 10 percent. Scientists never like the words like always, never, we don't use those words. And we have a wonderful word which we always use generally. <laughs> the most favorite word of scientists. You know, generally speaking, it's about 75, okay? Th that, that's the idea. Now, let's look at some of these states. And um, funny thing happened when I first trickled out a bit of news about this book on June 16th last year. It was in a nice function in Delhi uh, from Atharva Forum. And uh, I was one of four speakers. And uh, the speaker who was asked to summarize the talks of the other three, one of the other speakers, Bhavesh Kansara, is here in the audience. And the fourth speaker who summarized the views of the other three was Professor Murli Manohar Joshi, and whom, of course, uh, we were very honored that he was there to summarize. And then I told him, we t I announced the book. And I said, Professor Joshi, I've known him for many years as an academic uh, rather than as a politician. So I said, look at my first two states. If you buy the book, again, buy the book first. <laughs> then I'll sign it and write your name and everything nicely. <laughs> OK. So my state number one is Gilgit. And my state number two is Baltistan. And uh, Professor Joshi, he threw his head back in laughter. And <laughs> he was really, really happy to see that. So you can see I'm quite good at predicting. I wrote this uh, around uh, August of 20, 
21. Long before all these things are happening in our favorite country, <laughs> our western neighbor, whatever you want to call it. I don't think it's a country at all anyway. <laughs> Chalo, but that's another, that's another point for some other discussion. So, now all my friends, they kid me and they tell me, how's your MFC doing? The MFC means my favorite country. <laughs> so, so, see I wrote about Gilgit and Baltistan because, and I justify that also. And the fact that they are all part of this thing, you know. Sumeru Mountains. What is the Sumeru Mountains? It's all here, no? It's there. Mount Meru. It's there. It's all written down. They can be Shias, they can be Sunnis, they can be anything. They are all part of Bharat Varsha. They're not different. Not different at all. And in fact, I've made a prediction that we don't have to go anywhere with armies and all to take over those places. They themselves will come to us. I'm completely convinced. And I've argued that also. Reason, reasonable European commentators have said when there's a powerful civilizational state growing, small things in the peripheries will like to join them simply for their economic benefit. Nothing else. Your religion, religion, sab, it's not very important. We only resort to that when we are poor. Let the economy of this country become, you know, whatever they're saying, 5 trillion, 6 trillion, 10 trillion. When all that happens, all this garbage that we see around us is okay. Now, finally, the economic justification for this. This is the last point. Apart from all the civilizational things and other things that I've been talking about, now, I give an example of what I call my four Ks, K. First K is Kashmir, just the valley, hmm? just the valley. Second K is Kutch, this side. Third is Kongu, hmm? the region around Kowe. And the fourth is Kashi. So in the four directions, Kashmir, Kutch, Kongu, Kashi. Now, I don't know how many of you have visited the valley, but I have gone there many times in the course of my work because we have some important national labs and all that there. And I have traveled quite a bit in the valley, including areas near LOC and all that. Now, Kashmir, the valley itself, two Flowering plants grow there in abundance. One is lavender and one is rose. Lavender actually, it grows wild. and doesn't require water also. This lavender and rose are very valuable plants because from that you can extract something called lavender oil and, and rose oil. Now there is a small country in southeastern Europe called Bulgaria whose entire economy is based on lavender oil and rose oil. They're doing something in Kashmir, but it is like some Jugad operation. You know, it's very wasteful, and the lavender oil and the rose oil they produce are of very low quality. It cannot compete with the Bulgarian product in the world market. Now suppose you had a small state called Kashmir, Hmm? By the way, another justification for this is each of these 75 states roughly has 2 crore population. So the populations of everything, so administrative convenience is very high. Suppose you have this small Kashmir state. Now don't start telling me all the fellows there will be Muslims, they will want to go away to Pakistan. No, they don't want to go. I can tell you that. Nobody wants to go. So everybody knows that India is a nice country, it's a powerful country. Nobody wants to go. Let me assure you. No, no, it's a hoiga, they all will do something, Mecca, Medina. No, nothing like that will happen. <laughs> Absolutely not, I'm telling you. Huh? I've heard a lot of things in, in, from North Indian side that there is no such thing as a moderate Muslim and stuff like that. We must start getting out of these mentalities. Got to look forward, got to look positive. Again and again, you can't go back to Mohammed Ghazni, Mohammed Ghor and all those fellows. Can't do it. Can't afford to. 
we have no time this is a country in a hurry you sit with all that nonsense you will never go anywhere now you do that lavender and rose oil properly kashmir state that small one will become economically more powerful than bulgaria one small part of our country can become more important than a whole country in europe take kutch what do we know about kutch hardly anybody lives there it's a very big area it's got only sunshine and nothing else so what's the immediate thing that should come to your mind solar energy today the leader of solar energy is israel which is very small in area compared to kutch kutch if properly developed so just like only the agriculture ministry of this one should be important only the non conventional energy ministry of kutch should be important all the others don't count so just stress the solar energy part this will give electricity to this whole country and to many other countries in the world so you see by having these small states and concentrating niche areas you can get economically strong states now it's only a matter of detail you come to kongo what do, when you say kovai you think of tirupur you think of the fabric the garment industry you, for people in kovai for this respect chennai is too far away it is some distant place for people in srinagar jammu is very far away for people in bhuj ahmedabad is very far away they won't understand that is the local thing the diversity all those strange mangoes that i have described no same same thing comes again and again they are all very different and yet part of the same thing uh, so you will just this kongo thing will beat the whole of bangladesh in this fabric and textiles and finally kashi kashi we have got i have taken kashi actually as parts of eastern up and parts of western bihar so the area near araria that is the shaivite part kashi was originally a buddhist center so i have put all those areas you see there you have got in kashi you have got buddhism you have got sanatana dharma and you have got islam you have got all the three religions make it like a huge vatican city i say we go there to vatican city paying lots of euros just to see some old relics and all that make this the tourism capital this kashi of the whole world it's bigger than jerusalem you don't tie this kashi to the, all these other funny places in up you've got your own thing there so what happens is you get 75 very strong economic power houses and in the meantime you're going to get a very big bonus see finally in a good federation and let me tell you i have described it carefully in the book in 50 years of coalition government what we have had people glorify the coalition governments especially the opposition that was not federalism that was federalism at gun point there were so many itty bitty fellows who were just coming together to get 272 seats in that bloody lok sabha so they didn't care what they did as long as they got 272 that's all 272 as that lady said also 272 she said hmm i think some of you know whom i'm talking about so get 272 see can't run a whole country with just one 272 number in your head so what have they done when jailalita went there and said i want 69% reservation this uh, uh, what was that thing that ninth uh, ninth schedule where all the things were put there which cannot be subject to judicial review after that that is not federalism somebody is saying they are going to bring the government down if you don't do what i am telling you to do that is not federalism at all and that's the next next thing that has happened is 
since now one party has got a majority in the Lok Sabha, these other guys are howling. See, they should know one thing, that if you want to have the first-past-the-post system in a parliamentary democracy, then if one party gets a majority, then it's going to be a majoritarianism government. It cannot be a consensus government anymore. Everything will not, no need to go to some parliamentary committee. There's no debate, nothing. They've got a majority, that's it. When will the opposition realize that it is a must be a majoritarianism? Otherwise, what's the point of getting that 272? All they want is those coalitions that they can go on doing whatever they like. That's all that they want. Fine. I mean, we must call a spade a spade. And so what happens is that in this present scenario, the states will become economically strong. The center will be politically strong. What we are having today is states are politically strong and, and center is economically strong. Center doesn't need money. The states need money because all our daily lives, so many common things which we do every day from morning to night, it is the responsibility of the state government. I worked in a university called Hyderabad Central University, now called Rohit Vemula University. You know, there was no need for that university. Why not strengthen Osmania? Do you need IIT Madras? Why don't you strengthen I uh, University of Madras? Do you need NCL in Pune? Why not strengthen Pune University? The universities anywhere in the world are meant for this purpose. The center does not have to come and start opening IITs, ICERs, all these things. Simply because they feel the states can't. State has to give you education. State has to give you health. State has to give you roads. State has to give you all those things. And the state has to make its own money to do all this. When you have politically powerful states, you will get the likes of Mamata, Stalin, Sharad Bawar, all these characters. Center only should be politically strong. Because tomorrow, if my favorite country and the other one there, that side, the China, if they all start doing some funny things, center has to have a clear idea. We heard something about these Khalistanis just now. So center only should be able to do all that. So when a combination of a politically strong center and economically strong states, plus optimizing diversity, which is our big natural strength, that is what is described in chapter four. Finally, the last chapter, Glory, another five minutes? Oh, very nice. Ten minutes is like Pacific Ocean. <laughs> so, the last chapter actually is a bit introspective. And it's entitled, Quo Vadis, Where Do We Go? And it talks about this whole beautiful thing called Bharat Varsha as a complex system. And I talk about the difference between what is complex and what is complicated. These two terms mean something entirely different in sciences, social sciences, humanities, everywhere. And it is best explained with two familiar analogies which we all come across. Like suppose we have four or five roads which meet at a circle, each of them with traffic lights. This is very common in Bangalore. And because the, of the old circles that the Maharajas put up in various places, so you have many roads reaching these circles. So you have five, six, even in some places, big circles. So any car that comes there on an average is stationary, suppose there are five roads, for 80% of the time any car that comes there is stationary. So only for 20% of the time that particular car is allowed to move because everything else is waiting. Now suppose some traffic light something in that whole thing breaks down, which happens very often in Bangalore. Then there is utter chaos. Nothing moves, everybody might is right then. You know, Matsya Nyaya goes on over there. Everybody does whatever they like. Whole thing becomes a mess. That is a complicated system. When a complicated, syst a complicated system can break down, if any one of the parts breaks down, 
And the only way of solving the problems of a complicated system is to put in redundancies. So in my lab, for example, I have several postdocs. Somebody will be falling sick, somebody will have a family commitment, somebody will not be able to come to the lab, something that will happen. So what do I do? I hire more than one postdoc to do the same job. So that even if one goes away, the other fellow will start doing the job. The biggest, India was a complicated system. If you read the works of Vivekananda around 1900, when he bemoans the fate of India in 1900, and we heard earlier a talk which talks about the Renaissance, the revolutionary movement, a number of things happened. The first Indian Renaissance happened in Bengal, Bombay and Madras around 1900. So at that time, people started coming out of this. It was a complicated system which had broken down completely. And then came a huge blow, and that was partition. The thread of partition runs throughout my book. You cannot read my book without being aware of partition throughout that book. Because it has lost, our civilization has lost sacred geographical space. Dhara, the earth. We talked about Ma Durga in the Lalita Sahasranamam towards the end. Some magnificent names come out at the end. Dhara, Dharasuta, Dhanya, Dharmini, Dharma Vardhini, Loka, Tita, Guna, Tita, Sarma, Tita, Shamatri, Banduka, Kusuma, Prakya, Bala, Leela. Dhara, she is the earth. Dharmini, she is the embodiment of Dharma. Dharma and land go together. And when we lost the Indus Plains, we lost a part of ourselves. An integral part of being a Bharatiya was lost forever or we don't know. Maybe they'll come back now. Maybe they will. Or maybe we'll have another problem how to prevent them from coming in. I don't know. I'm not a politician so I can afford to talk. So, this dhara, the sacred space which was gone, I think that is coming back in chapter 5, where I talk about other countries. This is a civilizational state. I talk about other republics. I talk about France, Germany, and China. And since I'm in Puducherry, let's talk a little bit about France. Little. It is a perfect nation state. Absolutely. I'll finish in 4 minutes, 59 seconds. So, I'll talk about France, the revolution, 1787 or whatever. And uh, then they sort of went through, that was the first republic. And then there was Napoleon who came in and threw out all his things. While he was still alive, the next thing that happened was the Congress of Vienna in 1815 which was the first concrete attempt to define a nation state. And this first republic went on in some strange way. There was a re restoration of the monarchy. And this went on till 1848, when the second republic started. And uh, this too went on. There was a monarchy, good and proper then. And this went on, I think, till 1871 or something, when the Third Republic started, the monarchy was finally removed. And uh, the Third Republic, then the Fourth and the Fifth were only variations of the Third. But that is a perfect example of a nation state, France. Because language, literature, culture, diet, the habits, the behavior of the people, the political boundaries, Everything is perfectly contiguous. Very few people speak French outside France, maybe a little bit in Belgium and Europe. And therefore, when the French got their colonies, like Pondicherry, they treated them very different from the way the Brits treated British India. All these places, like the ones we are standing in today, became parts of metropolitan France. It was not the way in which the British treated British India at all. 
There they separated the Indians from the Brits. Here I am told there are still 1,000 people who are French citizens and vote in the French elections. French is spoken here. No distinction was made between places like Pondicherry, Cameroon, Algeria and all that. For all intents and purposes, they were France. That is a nation state. The perfect example of a nation state. And in chapter 5, I say that these three great republics, France, Germany, China, they all needed about 100 years to settle themselves properly. The US was the only one that got it right at the first shot. And there's a very interesting reason why US got it right and France got it wrong. This is important for us in India today. When the American Revolution happened, anybody who was a friend of the British and the old order were ruthlessly removed. They had nothing to do with what happened in America. In France, however, when the Republic came, gradually the monarchists and all these people started coming in in the period 1787 to 1848. They were not so ruthless in removing the ancien regime. And as a result, their progress towards a proper republic was that much delayed. Tomorrow there will be, there is already a Bharatiya revolution. We are all part of it. To quote Dean Acheson, we are all present at the recreation. We are, this is the second renaissance that's happening. The first one was 1900. This is the second one which is happening. We're all part of the Renaissance. So feel happy. Don't feel sad. We are part of this. This is what you have to tell the youngsters. And we should do what the Americans did and what the French did not do. No member of that old order should be allowed to come in anywhere. Allowed. Don't start giving me all that crap about sab ekhi hai, hab sab, sab se paas jana, every should go together, we should all do it together, India is great. India is great, Bharat is great, nobody is denying. Don't go for bringing, you can never take everybody along, never. Not in a free society, which we always want to be. So in this kind of a situation, anybody who is even vaguely looking as if they are supporting, and so many fence sitters, this way, that way, that way, this way. All these people should be removed. Outright. Please follow the Americans and don't follow the French in this regard. So with that, I think I stop. I think, I don't know, a few more seconds. My timekeeper. Zero. One, zero. Thank you so much, Vanakkam, Namaskar.